Hi, my name is Kelly Santorosa. I'm a policy analyst with AUMA, and welcome to Fueling Community Wellness Through Healthy Food Environments in Recreation and Sport. And we're pleased to bring you speakers today from the Alberta Recreation and Parks Association and the Alberta Policy Coalition for Chronic Disease Prevention to talk and answer questions about developing healthy food environments in recreation and sport. After the presentation, we'll have around half an hour for questions, and I'm going to turn things over right now to Lisa. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Kelly, and good morning, everyone. So we're really pleased to be here today. Um, so I'm Lisa McLaughlin, and I'm a program manager with Alberta Recreation and Parks Association and with the Communities Choose Well program. And I'm here with Ashley Hughes. Um, she is a registered dietitian and a project assistant for the Alberta Policy Coalition for Chronic Disease Prevention and a research assistant for the Center for Health and Nutrition at the University of Alberta. So Oh, I should just flip forward here. All right. So, who where are we? So, for those who are maybe not as familiar with um, the two organizations that we're representing today, I'll just give a little a brief overview. The Alberta Policy Coalition for Chronic Disease Prevention is a coalition of 18 organizations who have come together to coordinate efforts, generate evidence, and advocate for policy to reduce chronic disease risk in Alberta. Um, the Policy Coalition is housed within the University of Alberta School of Public Health. The Alberta Recreation and Parks Association is a not-for-profit charitable organization with over 1,100 members in and beyond Alberta, and it aims to build healthy citizens, communities, and environments, promoting recreation and parks as essential means for enhancing well-being. The Communities Choose Well program, which I manage, is a provincial program funded by Alberta Health, and it seeks to stimulate and strengthen community action to enhance wellness by enabling all Albertans to eat well and be active. The program offers resources to support the development of programs, policies, infrastructure, and partnerships that foster healthy living in communities. And so although Ashley and I are here presenting today, there are many organizations in Alberta interested in the issue of healthy food environments in recreation sports settings. Um, and some of those organizations are listed on the, the slide. So as a result of the fact that there are so many different organizations interested in trying to facilitate healthy food environments in these settings, um, I formed a collaborative group in 2013 to provide an opportunity for sharing and communication as well as collaboration. And over time, the name of the group has become CHEERS, the Collaborative for Healthy Eating Environments in Recreation and Sport. And so I'm just pointing this out because collaboration is one of the key things that's really been driving the changes that have been happening over the last few years. And some of the initiatives that we're going to be highlighting today have been carried out by members of this collaborative. So today's webinar will help you to learn about opportunities to enhance well-being in your communities through policy change to improve the food environment in local recreation facilities. The webinar will highlight the importance of a healthy food environment in recreation settings, current research about recreation food environments in Alberta, evidence-based strategies for change, and examples of successful healthy food and beverage policy change in recreation settings from Alberta and across Canada. We will end with an overview of key resources and take any questions that you have. We've been working on trying to move this topic forward for a few years now. And reflecting back, we've identified several factors that have been important to making progress. We've already mentioned collaboration with other partners, so the rest of the presentation will focus on the other four components. Before we get into this, though, we just want to talk a bit about what food environments are in general and why this topic is important in recreation. As you probably know, recreation centers are often the hubs of communities where people spend a lot of their time. People of all ages come to recreation centers to engage in sport and physical activity, artistic or cultural activities, and to socialize. For some people, they might not spend, they might spend just as much time at their local rec recreation center as they do at home. Rec centers also serve a large numbers of children and youth, and this has been shown through the research which provides an opportunity to support their health and reinforce healthy living messages they're receiving in school through their health and physical education classes, as well as comprehensive school health initiatives are happening in many schools across Alberta. So all in all, recreation facilities are an important resource for community health. We can talk for hours about the numerous physical and mental health benefits recreation facilities provide. When we talk about health, it's often framed as healthy eating and physical activity. 
So when we enter our rec facilities, what we teach about being active is front and center. And that's often when people are there to, to take part in physical activity programs, whether it's um, attending, swimming in the pool, attending programs, going to the fitness center, playing in a hockey tournament, um, participating in a local chronic disease walking program, and, and other examples. However, the irony is that those same venues that are promoted as spaces for wellness activities through physical activity serve food that is not considered beneficial for healthy growth and development, or for learning, prevention, management, and treatment of chronic disease, mental health, and so on. So what we teach our children and even adults is often not what is available within these facilities. We can talk about individual choice, and people can choose to eat the foods or not. However, our environment is what supports these decisions and makes the healthy choice either an easy or difficult choice. A supportive environment is key to making these individual choices sustainable. If there is an abundance of unhealthy food and beverages in recreation center concessions and vending machines, prominent advertising of unhealthy food and beverages, um, a culture that promotes the consumption of unhealthy food and beverages at recreation and sports events, it's not easy for people to make those healthy choices even if they want to. The fact that wellness is the core business of recreation is also clear in the Framework for Recreation in Canada 2015 Pathways to Wellbeing, the key document that's now setting direction for the recreation se sector across Canada. The framework demonstrates that recreation has wellness at its core and is an important partner in addressing challenges and troubling issues in today's society, such as increases in sedentary living and obesity, decreased contact with nature, and inequities that limit recreation opportunities for some population groups. The framework was released last year and is the result of a comprehensive consultation process that began at the 2011 National Recreation Summit right here in Alberta. The framework identifies five goals and priorities for action for each goal, including the obvious goal of providing opportunities to get people moving more during their leisure time. However, the framework also identifies the importance of the physical, and social environment and the need to help people adopt healthy lifestyles by making healthy choices easy choices. This goal has implications beyond physical activity. Promoting active living is important, but healthy food environments should exist in settings that promote physical activity participation to teach young people that it requires both healthy eating and activity to create a healthy body and mind and to encourage adults to be positive role models. So why is there so much fuss about the foods available and promoted in recreational and sports settings? Well, first of all, 30% of Alberta children and 60% of adults are overweight or obese. And the issue is that this is leading to increased risk of many chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer, and many more. As well, children have been found to be not consuming enough fruit, vegetables, and milk products, so they're not getting the healthy diet that they should be getting. As well, although there's been many initiatives going on in schools over the last several years to create healthy school, food envir school environments, children actually spend, over the course of the year, 80% of their waking hours outside of school. So there needs to be more efforts placed on home and community environments to be able to support the health of children and youth. It's also been found that 15% of teen eating occasions occur outside of the home and the school. So again, community settings like rec facilities may have important impacts on youth dietary habits. What's really interesting is that research has also found that youth who play sports consume more calories fast food and sugar sweetened beverages than youth who do not participate in sports. So that definitely is ironic. As well with children regularly participating in organized sport and activity, families often manage their busy schedules by purchasing regularly available food such as fast food or convenience items and foregoing meal preparations at home. Research has also confirmed indeed that recreation food environments are obesogenic, meaning that they are typically high in calories yet offer little nutritional value. And finally, just this year, for the second time, Alberta's recreation facilities received a grade of D um, in terms of the availability of healthy food according to Alberta's report card on healthy eating environments and nutrition for children and youth. To close this part of the presentation, we'd like to show you a video created by Everactive Schools and the Alberta Schools Athletic Association, who are supporting healthy changes in the foods served, sold and served at Alberta school sporting events. 
It's part of a campaign that encourages individuals to pause and think differently about accompanying unhealthy food with school and community events where healthy habits are the focus. All right, everyone, we'll just give it a minute. Um, there might be some technical difficulties with the video, so we'll just uh, see what's happening here, and we'll proceed with the presentation. All right, so maybe I'll just have Kelly bring back up the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, so yes, yeah, so she's posted the link to the video in the chat box. Um, it's just under four minutes. It's a great video. And um, if you weren't able to see it just now, uh, we really encourage you to take a look at it later. Um, it's right on the Everactive Schools website, and you can easily watch it and share it with other people that you think might be interested. Um, and so what's interesting to know is, as I mentioned, um, Everactive Schools and the Alberta Schools Athletic Association um, worked together to create that video. And as of, the, as of this past fall, 2016, all food and beverages sold and provided at Alberta School of, School of Athletic Association or ASAA Provincial Championships held in member school facilities must fit within the choose most often and choose sometimes categories of the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines for Children and Youth, which Ashley will talk about um, in a little while. So this definitely has implications for community facilities in which these events are being hosted. And it's great to see that this is, um, this, that they've decided to adopt this policy um, and ask their member schools to promote healthy eating at their school sporting events. So before we move further into the presentation, it's important to ensure that you have a common understanding of what is meant by the term food environment. The term food environment reflects the idea that healthy eating is more than an individual choice and may be influenced by the environments in which we live. The community nutrition environment, which is defined as the, the number, type, location, and accessibility of food stores, can influence individuals' food choices for better or for worse. Food and food advertising are all around us every day, in our homes, our neighborhoods, and in many buildings and spaces in our communities, like workplaces, schools, recreation centers, restaurants, supermarkets, convenience stores, and so on. Living in a community with predominantly unhealthy food stores, for instance, has been found to increase consumption of unhealthy foods because these items are more accessible and are heavily promoted. So you can think about the food environment on a macro level, such as an entire province, a region, or a community, or on a micro level, such as within a specific setting like a school, a workplace, or a recreation center. Within recreation settings, there are many operational areas where food may be available or promoted, and where policy and programs can have an impact. This framework from BC's Stay Active, Eat Healthy program can help you identify areas to focus on when working towards making healthy, food cha healthy changes to foods and beverages available in your facilities or community. The framework also depicts how recreation facilities are not only a place of recreation, but a place of work. Not only can staff wellness be, be supported by offering healthy choices at meetings and training events and in workspaces, but the marketing of healthy food choices its availability in vending machines or food services, and even initiatives happening in or around recreation centers, such as community gardens or good food box programs, also impact staff. 
So now I'm going to uh, pass it over to Ashley, and uh, she'll cover the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Lisa. So we talked briefly about collaboration being a key facilitator, but also the presence of provincial nutrition guidelines and research can support creating healthier food environments and recreation. So I'll move into that section next. In 2008, Alberta released provincial nutrition guidelines for children and youth, outlining opportunities for schools, recreation, and child care centers to create healthier food environments. These guidelines divide foods into three categories, including choose most often products, choose sometimes, and choose least often products. And there's been significant progress to improve the school nutrition environment as a result of investments in the work from health promotion staff, dietitians, and organizations such as Everactive Schools mentioned earlier to facilitate comprehensive school health. And we have an opportunity to learn from these changes, positive changes in school settings, and apply them to the recreation environment. There's also been a number of uh, important research studies that have come out in focusing on the recreation environment, and particularly uh, attributing this research to Dr. Dana Olstad is important. And this research is primarily focused in and around the Edmonton area within the province of Alberta. We've been fortunate to have this ongoing research within the province since around 2009, focusing on awareness, adoption, and implementation of the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines in recreation centers, as well as the effectiveness of various strategies to promote the sale of healthy food and beverages using techniques such as nudging to create environmental changes that support healthier choice. In 2008, one research study looked at 151 publicly funded recreational facilities one year after the release of the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines. Recreational facilities completed an interview to examine their knowledge and use of the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines within their facilities, what their priority was for healthy eating, as well as any barriers they perceived to using the guidelines. And what they found was that half of participants had heard of the guidelines. With this in mind, only 14% had agreed to follow the guidelines, and 6% had taken steps to apply them. Of those facilities that were surveyed, a number of them focused on healthy eating as a medium priority. However, this was only around 50%. Those that focused on healthy eating as a high priority was around 13%. And looking at those who had already implemented nutrition policies, they found there was around 19% of facilities. So what was influencing the use of the guidelines? There was a number of barriers that facilities faced. The first was concern around a loss of profits and whether or not there was a, a disadvantage to selling healthier foods concerns around whether customers would continue to purchase unhealthy foods even if healthy foods were offered. Another barrier included an incompatibility with an organization's mandate. So for example, recreational facilities, some of which prioritized pool safety over and above healthy eating. Another barrier happened to be perceived limited control, in which case food service managers felt that they didn't have control over the types of foods that private food service operators would offer in concessions. There's also concerns around complexity, such as the preparation, storage, and sale of healthier foods, as well as concern over limited resources, including the time and human resources required to make the change. And lastly, a focus on what current cultural norms look like within the recreation facility. There is the thought that the fries and burger mentality within um, a hockey rink was something that was important to customers, and making that shift would be difficult. Recognizing that barriers existed, there was also a number of key facilitators that were realized throughout this research. And these facilitators were categorized as both necessary factors, so those that could assist facilities in implementing a change towards healthier options, as well as those that might be helpful. And some of these factors included having a key champion who supported the guidelines, 
as well as values and beliefs that supported healthier eating, such as having recreational facilities values, goals, and norms consistent with Alberta's nutrition guidelines. In addition, the expectation that there would be benefits from changing the food environment toward the health-promoting environment as well as the addition of being willing to accept a small financial risk and combat social norms that unhealthy eating was a normal part of a recreational facility. Next, there was also the understanding, uh, a level of understanding or a level of nutrition knowledge amongst recreational facility directors and managers where they had an ease of understanding the Alberta nutrition guidelines as well as some background in nutrition knowledge. Resources were an additional support as well as positive relationships between managers and food service operators. Limited outside competition was also an additional facilitator. Other factors that were thought to be helpful included uh, a coming up of contract, um, pardon me, expiration. So when contracts were coming up for renewal and there was an opportunity to seek change or bring in a food vendor who was focused on healthier options, as well as learning from changes within the community itself, such as partnering or links with schools who are already implementing the guidelines for an additional support. So what can we do to change the food environment within recreational facilities? Researchers also provide evidence-based strategies that we can consider when we're making changes within recreational facilities. So the first that comes to mind is adding healthier options to your menu. One study based out of Edmonton in around 2012 in an outdoor community pool looked at offering healthier options on site and examining how this impacted consumers' purchases. This particular facility had two concessions, a municipally operated concession nearby a pool, which offered primarily prepackaged foods, around 9% of the choices were healthy based on the nutrition guidelines, as well as a privately operated target concession, which was opened for a shorter period of time, around 40 days. It offered a larger, more diverse menu with main dishes, beverages, and snacks, and 44% of the items on the menu were healthy. They measured Patchen's food purchases as well as concession sales during three time periods before the target concession opened, while it was opened and healthier items were more available, as well as after the target concession closed. And during the study, more healthy foods were available while the target concession opened. In fact, 9% of the foods that were healthy at the start of the study increased to 25% of the foods at the facility being healthy while the target concession was open. And what they found is that consumers' purchases mirrored the availability of healthy food. That is, they bought more healthier foods when they were more available. Healthy food sales increased from 8% at the start to 23% of items when the target concession was opened. And most importantly, the total revenue sold. Pardon me, the total revenue did not change, and patrons spent the same amount of money on food. An additional strategy con to consider is promoting, using creative promotions um, to, to focus on those healthier items within recreational facility uh, food services. This next study took place also at a community swimming pool within Alberta with a private concession stand located near the, near the pool. And researchers examined whether nudging could encourage customers to buy healthier items offered at the concession. Researchers tested a combination of nudges or subtle environmental cues to encourage customers to make healthier food choices. They also looked at a combination of nudges and price reductions. The first test they looked at was adding descriptive signage to the concession to promote healthier items. Signage was placed at eye level with descriptive appealing names for healthier menu items, which lasted for an eight-day period after which the signage remained in place and they added taste tests as well as free samples of healthier items were offered to patrons. This period of the study lasted for an additional eight days. The signage and taste tests then continued and the prices of healthy items were reduced by 30%. And this final test remained in place for eight days. Overall, what they found is that patrons, when they visited the concession during the busiest times of the day, more healthier items were purchased. And in fact, when the three interventions were combined, the sales of healthier items increased by 30% for patrons who visited the facility during this busiest time of the day. And when all nudges and price reductions were removed, 
this trend remained in place. So importantly, uh, the additional uh, point to recognize is that the daily revenue and profit was not affected by any promotions. So creative promotions is an effective strategy that could be considered to draw more attention towards those healthier items on concession menus. A third option to look at is identifying, clearly identifying healthier items on concession menus. This third study investigated the effectiveness of traffic light labeling, which is a simple form of menu labeling on concession menus that draws attention to healthier items and makes them crystal clear to consumers when they're looking at making a food selection within a rec facility. This study took place in 2014 at a facility within Edmonton. Traffic light symbols were placed next to foods and beverages on menu boards as well as food display shelves for one week during the, during the concession. Researchers compared food and beverage sales with and without traffic light labeling. And they found that traffic light labeling was able to significantly increase the purchase of healthier menu items. They noticed increases in healthier menu items such as main dishes, snacks, and desserts, as well as a reduction in the purchase of choose, most, choose least often products such as those which were main dishes and desserts as well. And importantly, they found that the addition of traffic light labeling to the concession menu did, did not affect overall revenue. And the total amount of monies received from concession sales, as well as the total number of food items sold, was not affected by the addition of traffic light labeling. So when reflecting on the recreation framework that was presented earlier, consider creative ideas within each area of the framework that you might consider implementing within a recreation environment, and also how you might incorporate some of these evidence-based strategies in order to support success, such as increasing the availability of healthier foods, ensuring that foods are attractively packaged and competitively priced. One example of this could be including traffic light labeling in concession or canteen menus or applying it to vending machines, or using creative promotions to encourage the purchase of healthier items, such as a coupon to try out a new healthy menu item, or a punch card to reward the purchase of five green light traffic light labeled items and receiving the 613. You'll also notice that policy encompasses all areas within the Municipal Recreation Food Environment Framework, as policy can help to set the stage to drive positive change within the food environment, as well as to help sustain programs and community efforts over time. So we're going to now take a look at another additional uh, piece called the Rec Focus module, and I'm going to pass that back to Lisa to share that. Great, thanks, Ashley. We've had the opportunity to gain insight into current practices regarding food services and the provision of healthy food, as well as readiness for change in Alberta's municipalities through ARPA's Rec Focus Healthy Food Environments module. The module is part of the Excellent series, a dynamic suite of benchmarking and analytical data services that provides information about current practices and performance to recreation and parks departments and organizations in order to strengthen recreation and parks in Alberta and across Canada. This module was developed in 2014 in response to growing interest in recreation facility food environments and the desire to assess the current situation, provide information to support decision making and monitor progress over time. The module will receive funding from the Government of Alberta from October 2014 to March 2015 to enable it to be provided at no cost to any interested, anyone interested in Alberta recreation facilities or Alberta communities. Uh, as of April 30, 2015, 43 people provided input um, into the module and completed either part one and or part two. So the data that I'm going to share is from um, that, essentially what was a pilot project. So this, this chart re represents the most advanced type of food services available in respondents' recreation facilities and the extent to which healthy options, so choose most often or choose sometimes as defined by the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines, um, are available within each type of food service. Participants indicated the highest level of food services available in their facility and it was found that 95% of respondents offer some form of food service in their facility. So anything from just beverage vending all the way through full uh, food services. 76% of respondents offered a, a, a snack concession or a full service food facility. And about 22% were just vending only. 
the majority of food and beverage services are operated by private vendors. And it was also learned that while many food services have some self-defined healthy options, there is a lot of room for improvement. This slide presents an image of respondents' readiness for change. When asked about the extent to which specific best practices related to healthy food environments and rec facilities are in place now, respondents also had the opportunity to select the level of practice they would like to have in place in two years and in five years. So the, the chart on the farthest left depicts the current practices in their facility, and the chart on the farthest right depicts um, where people would like to be in five years. These graphs show that many people are interested in moving the needle forward, though some are happy to stay where they are right now. But it's very encouraging to see that upward trend where, where more and more people want to move further along to offering healthy, um, healthy practices regarding food and beverage services in our facility over time. So what we wanted to do with this question is um, we, can, we don't have the ability to do an actual poll, but we're really curious if you can write down in the chat box the number that corresponds to your answer to the question, when it comes to improving the nutritional quality of foods or beverages available in your community's recreation facilities over the last 12 months, which statement best describes your facilities? So if you can just type in one, two, three, four, or five into the chat box to give us an idea of where you're at with your facility or community, that would be great. So over the last 12 months, which statement best describes your facilities? Just give people a minute to, to type in their response right into that chat box in the lower left-hand corner. All right, Dawn. Number four, lots of twos. That's OK, that's great, but at least, at least there's you're thinking about it. That's wonderful. Great. All right, so I've got a few people responding. If anyone else wants to jot down where you're at, feel free. All right, four and five as well. Great. Well, it's wonderful to see that there's a lot of a lot of people at least starting to think about it and talk about it, and some that have started to make changes. So, in the Rec Focus module, we did actually ask this question as well, and what we found was about 40% of respondents have made changes already. So they're either recent or they've been um, ongoing for some time. About another 40% are thinking about making changes or, or making plans. And only about 20% aren't quite thinking about it yet. So again, really positive to see that there is a lot of um, thought being put into moving forward with changes. Respondents were also asked about specific practices to support healthy food environments. A few examples of practices being planned or adopted to support healthy eating environments include using RFPs and contracts for food-related services to require healthy food choices to be offered, offering fresh fruits and vegetables in their facilities, um, using different menu strategies like improving the visibility of healthy options and identifying healthy options, and offering healthy choices at special events. Concerns about potential loss of revenue is a significant and important barrier to changing food environments and recreation facilities, as Ashley mentioned earlier. However, respondents in our Rec Focus Healthy Food Environments module indicated that this is less of a problem than people believe. About 18% of respondents reported that there was no change in their revenue, 16% reported a decreased revenue, and 14% reported increased revenue. But no one reported significant increases or decreases. So again, this is really good news to see that this is maybe less of a concern um, than people believe it to be. As Ashley's going to speak to shortly, while it's great to ha adopt better practices, having policy in place to support these practices helps to ensure that changes are sustainable. When asked, about whether, when asked whether a policy or guidelines exist that contains requirements or recommendations for healthy food and beverages to be offered in the facility, 
less than 15% of respondents agreed indicated that healthy food choice policies or guidelines were already in place, but about a quarter were, were developing or planning to implement policy, which is encouraging. So again, what we've seen here is that a lot of communities and facilities are starting to think about adopting healthier practices, but there isn't a whole lot of policy development happening yet. So that's definitely an important piece to consider when you're looking at making changes in your facilities. So we're, not, we're now going to shift to what I imagine many of you are most interested in hearing about, which is stories from communities who are making changes. The first story that I want to highlight is from the city of Camrose, and their story highlights the importance of community engagement in the change process. So in Camrose, the local public health dietitian, or I should say maybe one of the local public health dietitians, has been working with the recreation department and facility concession operator for a few years to implement changes. What helped them overcome resistance and gain momentum was conducting a patron survey to capture information about current purchasing patterns, potential changes to purchases if healthy items were introduced, opinions about which healthy food items patrons would like to see introduced, and ideas about what percentage of menu items should be healthy. They had about 247 patrons respond to the survey, and this allowed them to gain support from the city and the concession operator to move forward with contracts that included more choose most often and choose sometimes products because it demonstrated that people wanted healthier choices. Um, if anyone is interested in this survey, it can be shared with anyone who is interested, so feel free to get in touch with Kelly and we'll be sure to, to pass that along. So over the last year, um, we've been really fortunate to have the opportunity to work with several communities, um, three communities actually, on projects to offer more healthy choices or to um, offer fewer unhealthy choices or to promote the existing healthy options and encourage their sale. Communities received $2,500 in grant funding, ongoing support, and opportunities to connect with each other, learn and share, and to receive staff support. Um, so we worked with three communities, including the town of Okotoks, uh, Southland Leisure Centre in the city of Calgary, and the town of Grand Cache. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Okotoks did for their project because it's quite unique um, and creative, and I think it's been quite effective from what, what they are discovering so far. The town of Okotoks has a population of about 28,000, a very young population with nearly three quarters being under the age of 45 years and more than a third under the age of 19 years. Through their healthy eating initiative, Okotoks wanted to, to increase patrons' awareness of healthy foods available for sale at the concession, to increase patrons' awareness of which menu items um, available at the concession were healthy, and to motivate patrons to actually purchase those healthy items. So it's important to note that the town of Okotoks has service agreements with a private concession operator, which is Casey's Eatery, as well as with both Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Also, um, I think just this wasn't directly related to the project, but, um, but probably kind of connected in terms of them thinking about the issue of healthy food environments. They did um, actually redevelop their contracts and included clauses in those contracts with their um, food service providers to ensure that provision and promotion of healthy options and that they are displayed in the line of sight. So they've got um, a beverage sponsorship and agreement. Um, they also have healthy vending machine services and they have a concession agreement for two of their recreation facilities. And each, each agreement outlines different percentages of products that need to be um, that need to be consistent with the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines for Children and Youth, and they outline um, stipulations around how products should be placed um, either in the concession or in the vending machines. One of the things that Okotoks did that was really unique was they actually created a promotional campaign and launched it back in January 2016. They focused on their Recreation Centre annual facility pass holders, and they offered them a Healthy Food Choices reward card and an insulated lunch bag. So the reward card enabled people to buy health, four healthy items at Casey's Eatery, which is a concession, and to receive this fifth item for free. Pass holders also emailed, were, 
we're also emailed a survey related to healthy, related to food choices um, at the recreation center. And we're asked about their current purchasing behaviors, their awareness of healthy um, food options, and their preferences for options. One of the really neat things that they did as well is they had stickers printed corresponding with the traffic light labeling concept that Ashley outlined earlier in the presentation and actually had food items at the concession labeled with these stickers. So this goes back to helping people um, identify and understand which foods are considered healthy um, or less healthy. And these are just a couple pictures showing um, their different um, displays at their concession. So the one on the left is um, a refrigerated display right on the front counter of the concession, right front and center when people come up to the, to the counter, that's what they see. Um, the one on the right is actually a, um, a shelf that is located off to the side in the concession and it was once stocked full of chocolate bars. Um, and now it's not and the reason for this is that the concession operator has actually agreed once he sold all of the existing chocolate bars to not restock it. So now they're only selling um, really what's, the, what's there is gum. So definitely a positive um, change again in terms of the kinds of foods being sold at the facility. And this is just um, pictures of a couple of vending machines in the facility. And so on the left, what they've done is they've displayed the healthier choices. So milk, water, 100% fruit juice, um, and um, Gatorade, I guess, or Powerade there um, on, the, on the shelves that are much more visible to your eyesight, to your, in your eye line. And then the less healthy options are displayed lower down in the vending machines. They're not the first thing that you see when you look at it. All right, so now I'm going to uh, turn it back over to Ashley. Great, thank you. So we're now going to move into sharing a few stories of change from communities that have implemented healthier foods and beverage policies to support healthier eating environments and recreation. The Alberta Policy Coalition worked together with the Power Up Research Group within the University of Alberta School of Public Health to connect with communities who had successfully Im implemented healthier food and beverage policies and document these through successful stories of change. So I'm happy to share a few of those with you today. And these particular stories highlight some of the challenges and facilitators throughout the process of developing healthy food and beverage policies, as well as the lessons that they learned. The first story focuses on the city of St. Albert and highlights a successful effort to create healthier food environments in public city facilities, recreational facilities, by strategically redeveloping their vending machine and concession stand requests for proposals. In this particular story, it started out with a key champion. And this particular champion worked within the city of St. Albert itself. Mark Edwards, business and marketing manager for recreation and parks with the city of St. Albert, felt that there were few healthy options available at city facilities. And he was determined to make the healthy choice not only the easy choice, but an option in the first place. In 2012, the food vending contracts were coming up for renewal with city recreational facilities. And this was a window of opportunity to promote healthier food options. The first step in the process began with reviewing the existing vendor contract. Mark identified the section within which defined what a vendor was willing or expected rather to provide in their vending machines. Mark first reached out to the Alberta Recreation and Parks Association for support with creating more strict nutrition criteria within the request for proposal. The Alberta Recreation and Parks Association connected Mark in turn with a policy analyst at Alberta Health who helped to support the city in developing the new healthy food RFP by providing sample wording and sample proposals. Mark then brought forth his own experience from the business sector and initiated discussions early on with local vendors, vendors and businesses who might be submitting proposals to test the waters and see what their thoughts were around the proposed healthy RFP change. And what he learned was that although vendors were not enthusiastic, they weren't surprised by the shift towards healthier options. Mark also connected with city staff and council members to inform them of the proposed change. And they were very supportive of the change, as health and wellness was already a very large part of the city of St. Albert's brand. 
the launch of the new Healthy Food RFP was announced through a media release. And it was quite a lofty change at first. Vendors were required to submit menus that contained 80% choose most often products and 20% choose sometimes products based on Alberta's nutrition guidelines and zero choose least often products. Now, despite earlier business consultations, Mark quickly learned that indeed this was too early, of a too early and too lofty of a change at first for businesses to implement. Consultations with vendors revealed concerns that selling mostly healthy foods would be unprofitable. So Mark quickly revised the RFP to reflect 80% choose sometimes and 20% choose most often products. But he was firm at keeping choose least, least often items at zero. Proposals began to roll in, and Mark and his team assessed products presented through the proposals using the Healthy Food Checker, a tool available through Alberta Health Services, which enabled Mark to analyze those products within the proposals against Alberta's nutrition guidelines to ensure that his team selected vendors that met their nutrition criteria. Now, around the same time that the city decided to go through the process of the vending contract, Healthy RFP, they also decided to privatize a number of costly concessions in public recreational facilities. And what they did is the Healthy Food Concession Stand RFP went through a similar process and rolled out a few years later in 2014. Each concession stand had a different healthy food requirement based on the needs of the area. Those concessions that were located close to schools were required to have more healthy options available for sale due to the vulnerability of who would be visiting the venue, such as children and youth. Now, one key throughout this policy story is that Mark and his team continue to support vendors with the change process throughout the implementation of the policy. One new business, once new businesses were selected to operate the vending and concessions, Mark continued to work with them throughout the implementation process. For example, if businesses were concerned about losing revenue, they worked together to identify ways to make the partnership more profitable, for example, such as licensing more vending machines. City, city staff members were assigned to support business operations and visited the facilities to check menus and assist vendors along the way. Switching from the costly city-owned concession model to the private model also helped to reduce expenses and generate revenue for the City of St. Albert. In the case of vending machines, Mark reflected that while profits had been on the decline prior to the new RFP, they had now stabilized and he called the new healthy food RFP both financially and nutritionally healthy. One of the biggest challenges his team faced was getting vendors and concession stand owners to take the leap of faith to support healthier food options. And he acknowledges although there's still room to grow in making a strong business case for healthier vending and concession stands, there were strategic opportunities to support them through the process. He said it was important to show what opportunities were available to capitalize on the healthy RFP by giving examples of a range of healthier options they could implement in their facility, such as swapping out a soft drink with water in a combo meal. Some of the key learnings that came out of this policy story included having a highly qualified champion to pave the way, and also Mark Edwards happened to be in a decision-making role that enabled him to drive the process forward. Connecting with knowledgeable stakeholders was important, as was working closely with the business community and engaging them early on throughout the process. The City of St. Albert also had public support. Through city surveys, they realized that the community was very supportive of health and wellness lifestyles, and this complemented the change. An additional story comes out of the City of Edmonton, focusing on Moose Healthy Food Fast, a private food vendor who actually started operations in and around the 1990s, focusing on offering healthier items within private fitness facilities and gyms. Moose Healthy Food Fast attracted the attention of the City of Edmonton in and around, around 2012 when the food vending contract and concession contract rather was coming up for renewal at Kinsman Sports Centre.
The city had previously developed two, con or two policies in and around 2009, which focused on offering healthier food items. In particular, the city's operational vending guidelines, which stipulated offering 50% healthier items based on Alberta's nutrition guidelines, as well as their fresh strategy, focusing on sustainable, local businesses and fresh foods. Now, when the city's contract came up for renewal at Kinsman Sports Centre, vendors needed to identify how their businesses and what they would offer aligned with both city policies. And Moose was invited to submit a proposal. They were successfully awarded the contract and moved into the Kinsman Sports Centre with quite a lofty change. Their menu offered 85% healthy items based on Alberta's nutrition guidelines. And one of the first challenges that they encountered was low customer demand. Valerie, the owner of Moose Healthy Food Fast, reflected that some customers were looking for items from the previous concession, such as coffee and donuts. So Moose had to be very strategic in how they approached promoting and offering their healthier menu. Now, a few keys that were involved here involved looking at how the city had redeveloped Kinsman Sports Centre as an elite training facility. Moose went on to focus their targeted marketing to reach a particular demographic, and that was coaches, athletes, and trainers. And as soon as this demographic caught wind of a healthier food venue on site that was catered to their performance and athletic goals, the demand for healthier foods quickly changed. Moose was also able to maintain strong partnerships with the City of Edmonton, as well as to negotiate competitive prices for healthier ingredients with their food supplier. They also implemented evidence-based strategies, some of which we shared earlier today, including traffic light labeling, in order to clearly identify those healthier items on their menus. Now, the strategic marketing approach was key to their success within Kinsman Sports Center. They successfully were able to pilot an additional concession at Queen Elizabeth Pool, as well as win three additional contracts at public recreational facilities throughout the City of Edmonton. Moose's success speaks to the importance of policy as the foundation for driving change, and it actually helped to inform the contract bidding process within Kinsman Sports Centre. Identifying key champions, in this case Moose, who was very supportive of offering healthier items, was key to their success. Developing supportive partnerships and keeping open lines of communication throughout the process, as well as bringing forth learnings from the private sector into the public recreational facility. And being keen to be creative and use in innovative and evidence-based strategies to promote the sale of healthier foods and beverages. And the final story I wish to share with you today was out of the city of Hamilton. And after nearly a decade of preparation, including a two-year pilot test, the City of Hamilton was able to adopt a corporate-wide healthy food and beverage policy in and around 2011. Healthy food guidelines, in fact, set the stage for change, but it was, in fact, the consideration of developing a healthy food and beverage policy which helped to give the guidelines more teeth. Importantly, throughout this process and with their, and their success, speaks to the importance of providing support throughout the, state, the implementation stage. Now, in particular, they developed a task force to support the implementation of the policy. And this particular task force helped by providing supports from a public health nutritionist, as well as human resources, and a healthy workplace specialist. The task force has been a key facilitator to support policy implementation and worked closely with caterers within the community to develop approved menus to provide nutrition consultation to city staff requiring assistance in formulating menus that fit with the healthy food and beverage policy. They were also able to hold events such as recipe contests that had been important in terms of winning over the public and generating support and overcoming the perception that healthy food and beverage policies are restrictive. An additional important aspect of the implementation process was continued involvement from high-level champions. For example, having the city manager take time to judge a recipe contest helped to show that the city was committed to healthy eating. Additional reflections from 
Pat Elliott Moyer, the public health nutritionist, key in helping to develop and implement the policy was that the provision of ongoing resources and support for policy implementation as well as cultural change was key to the positive changes and successes the City of Hamilton has experienced so far. Now there are a number of key tools and resources that are available to support the policy change process as well as changes within the healthy eating environment in recreational communities. And I'd like to share a few of those with you. One particular project called FAIR, Food Action and Recreation Environments, which was spearheaded by the Alberta Policy Coalition, but in collaboration with a number of members and organizations throughout the province that are working on this work, has come together to create a number of tools and resources to support communities in implementing change. And some of these changes include, pardon me, some of these tools include the policy readiness tool, which is a self-assessment questionnaire that can be used by municipalities or recreation centers, communities, or groups to assess readiness for policy change and identify key strategies to moving the change process forward. Furthermore, there's also evidence-based strategies, a number of which we share today, which are available in the form of two-page research summaries through the FAIR project, which help to highlight these strategies that you can implement when considering what changes you'd like to make within your recreation environments, how to promote healthier foods, support policy development, and address some of the barriers to policy change. And lastly, taking key learnings from other communities in order to apply them to your settings. Some of the key policy stories that were shared today are available through FAIR's website. You can review them and reflect on how they developed healthier food and beverage policies, what were their challenges, and what facilitators helped them to move the change process forward. The FAIR website you can visit through apccprecproject.com, and that resource will be available at the end of the presentation. But there are also a number of other resources available throughout the province that can support creating healthier eating environments and recreation settings. Some of these include the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines for Children and Youth. Alberta Health Services has also developed a healthy vending toolkit, which includes planograms, sample wording for healthy RFPs, which can support creating a plan to shift the types of foods and beverages that are offered through vending machines and recreational facilities. The policy readiness tool, which I mentioned, to help create healthy food and beverage policies to support change. The lower left-hand corner represents the Alberta Health Services Healthy Food Checker Tool, which enables you to assess various food products against the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines and find out if they are a choose most, choose sometimes, or a choose least, least often product. There's also supports for children and youth in engaging in healthy eating in and around sports and activity. Alberta Health Services Sports Nutrition Handbook for Coaches can be a resource in that regard. And the lower right-hand corner includes reference to Everactive Schools, which has the video, which we mentioned earlier on in the presentation, as well as a number of various tools, healthy recipes, healthy menu options, um, through their healthy, hosting healthy sporting events toolkit. In addition, there's the Rec fo Focus module, which Lisa mentioned earlier, which communities can use to assess practices that they're engaged in to support healthier food environments and how they compare to other communities. Even beyond the province of Alberta, there's a number of tools and resources available um, that have been developed by communities doing this work across the country, including Stay Active, Eat Healthy's website, um, which we made mention to when we presented the framework earlier on. These tools and resources are available through the links that follow in the presentation, so I'd encourage you to explore them and see if there are um, some of interest to you that may support the work you're doing in your communities. So at this point, we'll bring the presentation to a close and open up an opportunity for asking questions. We'd like to acknowledge um, a number of organizations that have been doing this work throughout the province and who we've collaborated quite closely with in order to um, help to support change in this area. We've included our contact information as well if you'd like to get in touch with us after the presentation. So I'll now take it back to Kelly to kind of moderate some of the questions that may come through.
And of course, if there are any additional questions that come up after the presentation or during viewing, do feel free to contact us by using our uh, email addresses or phone numbers provided earlier in the presentation. This is a shy group. Is it because it's half an hour before lunch? <laughs> yeah, I think it's because the presentation was so good. You just anticipated all possible questions. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, um, there aren't any questions in the next couple of minutes. Uh, I just want to thank Ashley and Lisa for taking the time to come to our office today uh, to go over all this, all the supports and resources that you have to help you start planning uh, healthy food environments in your own rec centers locally. Um, on this slide, I have a couple of upcoming events. We'll be hosting uh, two more webinars in December, December 7th and 8th. And you can visit www.auma.ca slash events for more information on these and to register. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this morning and um, being a part of our webinar. So have a great day, and we look forward to engaging with you again. Thanks.